Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme, exploring the genre of stoner rock. It's a genre I'm kind of familiar with, but as I learned yesterday, maybe I don't actually know a lot about it. <laughs> We're going to continue on. This is only the second track we uh, have in the theme. We're going to be exploring something from Elder. We're going to be looking at Compendium off of their 2015 Lore album. This is the opening track to the album, so should give us a good taste of what that album would do and what Elder was attempting to create at this uh, period of their life. Let's dive in, see what's going on with Compendium. <laughs> I think that first section was in 13, alternating 6 and 7s. Ooh, a little bit of modulation there. and their metric modulation. But this verse is in 4-4. Four four. Really big guitar tones. Aside from some harmonies, the guitars and bass are frequently playing the same thing. It's a very classic rock idea presented in a, a modern large guitar production. Yeah, so we're back to a 13 beat phrase. I think that that solidifies my opinion that we started in 13 too. Or my hypothesis more than opinion, I guess. And at three here. Really big heavy atmospheres throughout though, but harmonically it doesn't really push in that same direction. It's a bit lighter than I would expect for these sounds. I 
like this guitar melody here is a, quite a bit optimistic. But heavy tension into this new section. Contrast the heavy weightiness versus the ethereal levity of the higher guitar line. That's oh, that's nice. It's also generally nice to have all three guitars doing something different here. Different layering and compositional style than that all for one style we saw in the verse and chorus. too is specifically in the verse I hear a bit of Sabbath or even solo Ozzy part of that's definitely the production on the vocals Ooh. but it's also in the back and forth between the guitars taking a lick and then the vocals singing a sentence So that was a 17 beat phrase, like 4 bars of 4 with the 1 beat extension. This is back to the 3 with an extension of 4 at the end of every 4 bars. Okay, so they like those extensions. So are the 13s 6 pulls with a 1 beat extension? Because even like that, they'll hit that last note for the finality, but they'll play it over and over, even though the phrase itself is over. They'll just hang on to that idea. Yeah, bringing back that intro hammer on idea, but do call and response with these harmonics. Beginning of this guitar solo gave me deserty vibes, just like yesterday's Kaya's did. So good at sitting in the pocket though. Little bits of flourish here and there, but for the most part, just a really steady drum, uh, drum performance. Okay, I 
back that big fuzz for a big finale. That's interesting too. I don't remember that the last time, any of the last times we went to vocal sections, but we had four bars of three for the vocals, and then three bars of three, or two bars of three for the uh, that little flowery riffy thing, which is a six-bar phrase. That's also just very odd. <laughs> Uh, ain't even number, sure, just unusual. Where do I start with this? Uh, a part of me wants to start with the idea of stone or rock. I'm still not sure I, I'm getting it yet. A lot of this just feels like classic rock I or sorry a little bit of classic rock but I think more so of heavy metal which I, I brought up yesterday too with Caius is uh, heavy metal plus psychedelic and big guitar tones and that's kind of present here too although I'd say less on the psychedelic section this just feels like heavy metal riffs played on really big modern fuzzy guitars And is, is that stoner rock? Is that what it is? I don't know. We're only two tracks into this week's theme. I'm really hoping that we get some more songs this week and some of the puzzle pieces start to click into place. What I really love about doing these genre-based weeks, especially for genres I don't know too much about, is seeing how different bands approach them. Because... Even within a genre, different bands are going to have different sounds. Um, and so by seeing a bunch of tracks back to back from different artists, I get to see what's unique about them and what's similar. And kind of not necessarily disregard what's unique about them, but kind of take that as a secondary component. And kind of find out what's at the core of a genre. It is... Honestly, what's helped me understand most of the metal subgenres that I now have a, a decent cursory knowledge of. I can separate them and hear a style um, and, and know what it is and some of where you know its history came from, thanks to a lot of you, but also thanks to having genre-dedicated weeks like this for me to get all this information in sort of a condensed way. Usually I start to see some patterns, though. By the second track and again I'm not uh, unless it's just heavy metal with big fuzzy guitars because that's what this feels like to me but it, that's only on the sonic level too there's also the composition uh, more importantly I think the structure yesterday's Caius also saw a bit more of a traditional idea of verse chorus verse chorus and then an exploratory bridge that came back to, I think, a chorus. Um, and here, we have a lengthy exploratory intro, and then a verse, and a chorus, and a little something here, and then another verse, and then another chorus, and then like four or five minutes of exploration. Maybe this is what makes stoner rock stoner. It's these really lengthy bridges in the middle of... Uh, 
I don't necessarily want to call this regular rock. I think there's other bits to it, but it does follow more genre convention, and then it breaks away from that for these uh, deep exploratory moments. I do think I enjoyed this bridge a lot more than Caius's yesterday, which seemed to be a bit more of a jam band idea. This one feels more constructed. I'm sure Caius's was pre-composed as well, but like I said, this one just feels like it has more depth to it. And I was generally more along for the ride this time around, but I still feel like it is a, a bit of a distant component to the rest of the song. The verses and choruses make sense. I'd even say that the lengthy intro makes sense within the concept of the larger song. The bridge, yeah, it, it just does its own thing. And uh, I, I kind of view it as, you know, separate. But aside from what is Stoner Rock, we're also here to talk about bands and songs and in, in isolation sort of so I do want to bring up one of the big things about this track that's pretty apparent from the beginning and quite clear by the end they love to play around with time I'd say it's actually as far as this song's concerned the defining compositional component to it there is a pattern to how riffs are formed in here too and we do have a pattern of call and response frequently showing up, but I think what's consistent in every section of this song is an adherence to creating a rhythmic flow and then subverting it. And doing so in irregular time signatures or irregular phrasing as part of the subversion. So right off the bat, like I mentioned, I'm pretty sure we have a 13 there. I counted it as alternating 6s and 7s, but I think there's a bar extension in there too. Because I think the final bar of the intro before we moved into the next section was a 6, which should have been the first half, which means we cut off the second half of that idea to move into the next section. So... If we are working with alternating 6 and 7 bars, the 6 would be an extension after having explored a full phrase, rather than giving us the full uh, collection, combination of the 6 and the 7. So I'm not entirely sure about that 13, which is why I came out of it a little shaky. However, later on in the track, we visited quite a few sections that were in 13, which, as I mentioned during the reaction, it gives me a little bit more confidence in my hypothesis that that opening idea is in 13. And as we explored more ideas that had uh, bar extensions and, and odd phrasings to it, the idea that we ended on a six kind of started to slip into place as well. We also have a few sections in here that are in three, and a lot of the time that the vocals are present, they're in four. Um, in fact, the verses are four bars of four. It is the most standard that the song gets. It goes all the way to the standard bar phrasing. But there's also sections where we see extensions off of this as well. Instead of a four bar phrase, maybe we'll have a five bar phrase or something like that. Um, we don't see too much of that in the first verses at the beginning of the song. But towards the end of the song, we do see a little bit more variation on that as we return back to some of those vocal parts. So time signatures are kind of wonky in here. As I already mentioned, phrasing is wild. Um, you know, I, I talked about it right there at the end. The final section of the song is in a six-bar phrase. That's unusual. A lot of music is written in four. Four-bar, eight-bar, even two-bar, if you want to cut that four and a half, 16, um, 32... I'm sure there's music written in 64, but that starts to get very large and it's difficult to keep track of an idea that is 64 bars long. <laughs> Even 32, I think, is a bit lesser used for pre-composed sections. And the only reason I bring it up is because there is jazz that works within 32 bar phrases, particularly during solo sections, taking 32 bar solos. Still though, multiple of four, a lot of music deals with this. It's longer than two, 
it's not too long. Eight bars can feel a bit lengthy. And it's even. It's divisible in half. It's symmetrical. There's a reason that fours use so much in music. Even down to the fact that our bars typically have four beats in them, which gives us that 4-4 four, four time signature. Four beats with the quarter note, one over four, getting the beat. Um, and so four just makes up a lot of the building blocks of, of modern music. And uh, for them to disregard that so often in this track makes it feel as awkward as it does. And they don't really try to cover that up at all. Whether it's an odd time signature or an odd phrasing or anything like that, they allow that, that roughness, that jaggedness to be a part of the song. It's really tough, uh, really tough to follow along with this track, especially since at any moment it feels like they can switch to something else. And this kind of comes back to that other part I was talking about, which is metric modulation. Uh, we heard this at the beginning with uh, shifting from downbeats to offbeats, shifting from that 6 to the 7. But there's also quite a few sections, actually it was right after that, where we have a slower pulse. And right after that we would go into something just a little bit faster and then bring it back down to that slower one. This is metric modulation uh, at its finest. Uh, we're moving from putting 7 notes into a length. I don't know what that length was, but a length of time and making it so that we're now going to put nine notes into that same length. Um, and so it's just a hair bit faster. There is no, well, it could be achieved, I suppose, with uh, an accelerando, well, not an accelerando, but uh, a tempo shift and a new time signature, but that feels like a lot of work to just change, I don't know, a tuplet grouping or something like that. Just to show that we're putting nine where seven used to fit. And uh, we actually see this all throughout the song. Not necessarily this idea of seven and nine, but just taking a rhythm and then speeding it up just a little bit and then slowing it back down. It's just push and pull constantly throughout. And so between all of these things, we have a song that's rhythmically, temporally very difficult to follow along with. Whether the time signature is odd, the phrasing's odd, they're adding an extra beat at the end of ideas, they're adding extra bars at the end of ideas, they're changing the time feel constantly, and it's usually a full band thing too, which does help a little bit. There's nothing polymetric going on in here, which could really <laughs> elevate the complexity quite a bit. Most of the bands, well, let me put it this way, in most of the sections, the full band is presenting the same rhythmic idea. And that's nice. It also removes this idea of syncopation, though, which I think is interesting, where they could keep that original, uh, for instance, in the 7 and 9, they could keep that original 7 pulls somewhere in a hi-hat or, or something like that, um, and then put the 9 against it and have that syncopation as they sort of bounce between each other and, and try to steal a spotlight. Now, granted, 7 and 9 is going to be tough to put together, and it's just going to sound like chaos, honestly. But there's a, a few sections, particularly where, when we work with threes and fours, that I think we could do this and create some really interesting rhythmic grooves based on the syncopation of having a backbeat and then a, uh, an accented pulse that is just slightly different from that. They never went that direction, though. They kept everything a bit more simple, which, like I said, given how much complexity we're already dealing with, might have been the right call in the big picture. So that makes up so much of this song. So much of how I understood it was through the rhythmic ideas that they present and, and how jarring a lot of the transitions are, not just between sections, but inside of sections, uh, where a riff itself will actually have a couple of different uh, time fields within it. Now, the other thing that really stands out to me on this is atmosphere. It's the size and fuzz of the guitars. They're massive. There's a ton of compression to them. A lot of white noise existing around the tones. Even the drums are rather big. When we had that bass focus somewhere in the bridge, we had the guitars off on the side doing their own thing. The bass was center channel. It was a massive sound, too. All the instruments are really large in here. and In fact, it kind of reminds me more of post-metal as far as... Uh, or sludge metal, actually. 
Um, as far as the, the tonality of it all, the, the heaviness and weight of it, it uh, doesn't feel very rocky at all. I think even hard rock is going to have less antagonistic tones on the instruments than here. They're going to feel smaller in general. And so it's, it's interesting, again, how compositionally I hear a lot of heavy metal, sonically I hear a lot of uh, post metal or sludge metal but it's still very rock it's not metallic isn't or is it I don't know how they happen to do that maybe it's just because there's no growls in it maybe it's because the drums are not super aggressive we don't have blast beats or anything like that in it it kind of has a doom feel to it as well in some places. There is a general weight, a heaviness to the entire song. But it doesn't really come from tempo like it does in doom metal. It's primarily the production. And so this was something that I struggled with throughout. Is that most of how I understand this song and its relationships are to other metallic genres. But I would never call this metal this would be a very light metal I, I don't know what kind of metal we can use for that uh, I, I guess heavy metal that's a pretty light version of metal c compared to where we are now of course at the time it was pretty heavy and maybe that's just it times changed if this had come out 30 years prior they might have called it heavy metal or stoner metal if that was a, a thing that might have been around. <laughs> um, but because I think Stoner Rock came out a bit later as these sounds... It's still heavy for rock. Anyways, I'm going to get off this topic. I'm just kind of... Uh, I'm kind of confused about the vocabulary of it. But also that I agree with the vocabulary of it. It doesn't really have much to do with the song. I'm just trying to process things. Um... If I was a, a reactor who shipped things off to an editor, I'm sure this little tangent would be cut out. But you get to see this, this wild part of my brain process. Um, but yeah, everything's like, it's just a really big sound overall. But not everything is big. And this, this intrigues me. I don't know that it necessarily fits. I'm curious about other people's opinion about this. The vocals. They're distant. They're thin, they're kind of hazy in a lot of ways. As I mentioned, I they, they remind me of Ozzy. And uh, I, I don't remember if I mentioned it when we checked out Black Sabbath in the past, but I do feel like, especially on those older Sabbath tracks, Ozzy's vocals are very thin compared to the instruments around him, and this only exaggerates that. It almost feels like they in, uh, enjoyed that aspect about uh sabbath sound and they wanted to emulate it but with modern sound so they made all the instruments bigger they made the, the volume of the vocals a little bit higher but they kept that thinness to the voice i think in a lot of other bands hands they might have decided to pump up the bassiness of the vocals they might have went with a different vocalist entirely just something to give it more presence against the largeness of the band and elder they don't they stick with it, and I don't think it's wrong at all. It doesn't sound strange, but it is unique. And that makes it stand out. Definitely grew on me by the end of the track, but eh, when every other instrument is massive, the vocals, I, I think, are they feel even more thin, even smaller, because of the instrumentation around it. Uh, last thing I want to touch on then is composition for the instruments. The drums are rather laid back, like I mentioned, very much in the pocket. They uh, they don't really have a lot of flourish to them. A couple of unique uh, little tidbits here and there, but for the most part, they are a human metronome and they are good at it. Just absolutely solid. The guitars and bass play a lot of home chords and root notes. In fact. One of the verses, might have been both of the verses, the core guitar lick was like 
12 beats of just one note. Dun, 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 dun. And then the last four beats is a little, uh, a little twinkling idea. Might have been that hammer on concept that we saw early on in the track. And like, that's it. For like a solid minute, you're going to get this one note. I think every other time that one note shifted to another on beats 9 through 12. But you're getting two notes then. And then, you know, the six notes or whatever in the faster moving part for a full minute. Um, yeah, there's there's just a lot of focus on atmosphere and texture over interesting melodic ideas or interesting harmonic ideas and again all the instruments are in on this one concept this changes in the bridge though we see a separation of ideas we find harmony within the two guitars we also find a couple of sections where the guitars have two completely different parts played simultaneously i don't know if i'd call it counterpoint because one feels particularly the one on the left feels a bit more ornamental where the one on the left is more of a lead idea but still two unique ideas going on at once we also have call and response like with the hammer-on uh, idea versus the Oh, the harmonics. That's what it was. Jumping back and forth between those two licks. Uh, and generally, just a, a an exploratory section. All of these sections feel like they fit within the song. I feel like vocals could have been put on top of any of them, and it would have been fine. Um, but it is... Some of it does feel like it doesn't do anything. And maybe that's not the point. But... Uh, stick with me in a hypothetical situation I you know I wasn't there when they were crafting this song I have no idea what the process was but some of these riffs like I said feel like they would have fit in the verse or the chorus and it's almost like they wrote a ton of riffs and unlike other bands who might have left some on the cutting room floor um, figuratively speaking and just created your verse chorus use one for the bridge put some words over and continued on a very traditional mainstream way of writing a song they kept all the riffs that they thought worked in the song. They just didn't put them in the verse chorus. They, they found their verse and chorus riffs. They stuck with it. And then they just took like their top five favorite riffs that didn't make the cut and slapped them together and called it a bridge. And so they fit sonically, but musically, I'm not too sure. Some of them I thought were very cool. They created a new expansive idea. The guitar solo that took us into the bridge I thought was nice. That created some elevation. Uh, it felt hopeful and optimistic, which I thought was pretty cool to go up against the big weighty heaviness of the song. A uh, cool way to balance that out. But others sort of just felt like filler. They were there to uh, fill up space. Uh, they didn't feel out of place, but they weren't adding any value to the song either, other than just extending it out. And, you know, I suppose that works too. If the purpose is to create something that feels like a journey, um, not every journey is going to be filled with high points. In fact, if you're driving to a, a place, a lot of that's just going to be going straight on a highway. That's not really interesting. So I guess the concept of a journey in narrative you could focus on some of the more mundane elements of the journey itself and the song does feel like we go somewhere it doesn't feel static or cyclical every idea does change the pace and atmosphere just a slight bit but it never really like i said did anything for me that added too much to the piece not like that opening guitar lick did not like the conversation between the two guitars with their two different voicings being the harmonics and the, uh, the hammer-on idea some of them just felt like they were creating an atmosphere that was honestly not too different from the atmosphere the song's been focusing on big heavy fuzzy weighty that kind of stuff um and again, we do get to play around with time and stuff in here. So I was never really bored. There's always something for me to engage with, um, either emotionally or uh, theoretically. But I don't think it's anything that would stick with me. And it's not anything that I'm really looking forward to on a second listen. 
it, like I said, kind of feels like filler. I'm kind of curious where everyone else sits on this. Is this song about the journey? Do you think cutting out any of that bridge would fundamentally change the song? Or are you with me where maybe some of that should have been cut out and it would have tightened up the pacing a little bit and allowed every section to impact the song in some way and to further it in, in some capacity? And so... You know, wrapping this up, I'm actually in a similar place to Caius in that I generally liked what they did. I think they have a good sound. Uh, the verse and chorus were fine. The bridge had some interesting moments, but overall, I, I could have done without some of it. And maybe that's what Stoner Rock is. It's atmosphere. And it's big bridges. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see as we continue on with this week. Um, I do have a little thing here to note. I forgot about this. I mentioned a couple of sections during the bridge reminded me of deserts. And Caius very much felt like a desert rock song to me. So much so that I forgot we were doing stoner rock week. And I started to talk about how I was learning about desert rock ideas from that Caius track. Um... But I think I've kind of figured out a hypothesis that I'm going to test this week if any future songs kind of present uh, a deserty vibe. I think it's a modern, like post metal, large guitar tone mixed with psychedelic atmospheres. And I think that alone, and using more psychedelic chord progressions and harmonies, might be the foundation to desert rock. I think structure plays a bit into that too, but when I when I landed on it here, it wasn't so much about a journey. It was just a specific sound. I was like, oh, that's kind of deserty. And it was a, a fleeting moment. It's like four or five notes. I'm like, oh, okay. So I wonder if that's it. It's a combination of, of sonic ideas and harmonic ideas. Anyways, I just wanted to share that little hypothesis with you. I'm going to read some lyrics here, and then we're going to wrap this one up. I'll uh I'll take some help with these lyrics if anyone wants to uh toss their hat in the ring as far as uh putting some thoughts in the comments. I don't know if this is supposed to be taken uh, widely as to be about everyone and and sort of life and experience in general or if it's a very specific um experience for this character says, I am born upon the cusp of revelation, a consciousness awoken by the dawn, a primitive undying fascination moved the hand that carved into the stone. This almost speaks to the creation of art and, and history as, as a whole. It says, uh, you know, a primitive undying fascination, something that's so old that we would call it primitive, but being fascinated enough to, says, move the hand to carve into the stone, to put, uh, you know, paintings into a stone, to put words or, or whatever um, in order to write or draw. It says, I was born with this, this fascination, which could be this specific person, but I can also feel that on a much wider idea of just humanity as a whole, the chorus is where I think I find the most confusion on whether this is specific or general. It says, faces change, thought returns to dust, ashen countenance, holy rust. This just feels like you saying time passes, things change, but things stay the same. But the final line says, I am compendium. And a compendium is a collection of Stuff, information, knowledge. So who is the I? Is that humanity? Is that history? A personification of history? I don't know. Verse 2, I think, talks about... Well, it feels like it talks about modern time, but also all time throughout history. It says, trapped inside a cultish hall of mirrors, taught to worship self-destructing flaws, running now the ravens getting nearer, fighting off the gnashing of the claws. 
this idea of feeling out of place, of having people, I like the idea of cultish hall of mirrors, people who blindly follow reflections of others. There's no one actually there. You're following an image of something. That's really great uh, writing. Uh, the idea of taught to worship self-destructing flaws. I mean, this is something that's existed all throughout history is humans acting against their best interests. But I, like I said, I can kind of see modern day out of this too. Um, everything from uh, overeating to... Uh, you know, consumerism, uh, hyper-consumerism, where we're at right now, uh, social media addiction, just all sorts of, uh, of things that uh, I would say are, are self-destructive flaws, but they're worshipped, and we're taught to worship this. It's, it's normal. Um, and then running now that the ravens are getting nearer, there's something catastrophic on the horizon. Uh, the ravens are a bad omen for that. And that could be something very specific in the story, but it could also feel like something across all of history. Humans working against their own interests, uh, following along with self-destructive ideas and activities, and some sort of, I don't know, destruction or, or terrible event on the horizon. It's, it's vague enough to be Something that's that's cropped up so often. And that takes us to the bridge. It says, this is the weight of heartbreak. This is the weight of life. A thunder at the temple, silencing endless strife. This is the only thing that really feels hyper-specific to me. Silencing endless strife. Unless this is a, a wish, possibly. The thunder at the temple. Because, I mean, endless strife, that's just humanity. Historically. We're not even at a point where we've ended strife yet, so it's still endless. There's no thunder that has silenced it. But bringing this back to a, a very general look, says this is the weight of heartbreak and life. This is just how things go. And so I think that's what this is mostly about. It's a very vague look at humanity over time and finding patterns throughout it. I still don't understand what the I am compendium line is though and I could be completely wrong on this entire interpretation. So like I said, these are my thoughts on Elder's Compendium, but what are yours? Do you have any takes, opinions, perspective on this that maybe I didn't land on? I'm trying to tie any of this back to the music and I have nothing at all. Other than maybe the bridge just being a really big passage of time. <laughs> um and not really changing at all. It feels like a very weak reading of the lyrics and music, but it is a, a similarity, a parallel between the two. I don't know. Put your thoughts down there. I'm curious how everyone else interprets this. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for this one. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC. As usual, we'll continue on exploring this genre. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.